Hi, I'm Pamela Wallen. Welcome to another episode of No Nonsense. We're going to tackle a complicated, interesting, important story today. So bear with us and kind of sit down and settle in. Get yourself a cup of coffee because we're going to be a while here. Project Reconciliation, an Indigenous-led organization that wants to buy a majority interest in the TMX. They are not a pipeline company. They are a company that wants to solve some pretty basic issues about Indigenous communities, futures, economic status, all of those issues across the country. So we have with us today Delbert Wapas. He's the executive chair and founder of Project Reconciliation and vice chair of the Indian Resource Council. He was also a three-term chief of Thunderchild First Nation here in Saskatchewan. Many other things. He's also got a Master's of Education from the University of Saskatchewan. So we might talk a little bit about education as well. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Pam, uh, Senator, uh, for that. And, <laughs> Pamela's um, good. That's All fine. right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you for this uh, tremendous opportunity. I want to start with the very basics because when you say project reconciliation, that doesn't sound like we want to buy into a pop a pipeline project it, it it sounds like how do you define reconciliation well i being chief i've um i've witnessed for many years um how I, i've seen indigenous leaders in action i've gone to many communities uh, through uh powwows through different ceremonies different cultural gatherings events and i've listened i've watched um, how nations have interacted with each other um, f- from a ceremonial, uh, from a cultural gathering perspective. But then when it came down to um, some of it being politics or, some, um, or, or even from an economic development perspective, I've seen where you have, you know, the haves and have-nots and, and how nations, when it came to money, how indigenous nations, you know, um, were very uh, exclusive to themselves or to a handful of uh, like-minded people and there were a lot of nations that were left out and and so how do we how do we bring people in uh, together as a collective uh, and to reconcile whatever difference that was there amongst ourselves to support one another to bring it back to what it was to to the way we hear the stories um, the way the stories were in the past of, uh, of you know mutually coexisting and benefiting uh, and supporting one another. So that was the intent behind reconciliation is that, you know, how do we reconcile amongst ourselves, get our house in order, and then, you know, reaching out uh, to industry, to government, to uh, to the, you know, mainstream society and, and, and reconcile our differences there. So you, it's it's a parallel process because it's about getting your own act together and, and Indigenous communities having sort of a, a shared objective, a most important of which is to get out of poverty and have incomes and all of that. And secondly, making that case to government, to business, to industry to say, look, we, we want to be partners, not just recipients of handouts. Yeah, we got to be real um, and, and, and be honest about, you know, ourselves. You know, um, I think that, you know, we, we can't, we, we can't uh, paint the picture that's not real. And, and to me, that's, that's what I've witnessed uh, through my eyes. Um, you know, and, and I think it's important to our children and our children's children that in order to be strong, to be stronger as nations, you know, we need to come together as a collective on, uh, on a common, you know, uh, common stand, I guess. And, and our biggest issue is, is poverty. No matter where we go, we're going to run into each other and we're going to have these issues that we have. And we have no choice but to try to make an effort, you know, to work amongst ourselves to help one another rather than driving past each other um, and walking past each other without acknowledging each other. You know, uh, that happens within our own communities, Mm -hmm. you know, where there's a lot of um, uh, dissension, you know, where we used to visit one another. We don't visit each other anymore. So if that's happening in our community, that's happening outside our communities and, you know, in, in other nations. So reconciliation to me is is you know tearing down all that kind of negative stuff and and building up with a positive 
So why did you decide then that the way to achieve reconciliation, if I can do that, is by buying a majority interest or having a stake in a pipeline? I, I think that, well, the, the reason why it's important for us to look at it from that perspective is that, you know, we have to, there has to be economic reconciliation as well. You know, when we look at the issues that are plaguing our communities, you know, missing and murdered Indigenous women, mm -hmm. you know, is caused from poverty. You know, um, you know, the missing and murdered Indigenous men caused from poverty, um, broken families. You know, uh, we have, we don't, we don't get enough support from government. Uh, you know, from a program and service delivery perspective, to deal with the mental health issues within our communities, uh, let alone you know the education dollars. You know, we don't get. You know, uh, in First Nations country, we don't get the level of education funding support, you know, that mainstream that the French immersion get, you know. Um, we get $5,300 a kid, you know, nominal role-wise, not $27,000 a kid, uh, a child, you know, within a French immersion. You know, so how are we able to, you know, to put our kids back on track and to reinstill the language, you know, that was taken out of them? You know, the, you know so... and And... You know, just suicides. You know, and and all uh, overcrowding. You know, nowhere to live. You know, the homelessness. You know, we have that within our community. So, to me, taking advantage of an opportunity that exists, and TMX look, pipeline, TMX pipeline, right? And looking at it as a means to an end, not the silver bullet, mm -hmm. but it's a means to the end, to an end, where we can make something better. And bigger than what that is you know to us it's not transactional you know when we look at getting involved in TMX pipeline it wasn't just an you know a business transaction here's here it is and that's it to us there's a lot when when indigenous people look at business it's from a responsibility perspective you know there's so much thought that goes into this okay so if we do this what does it mean mm -hmm. right it's it's not just creating money Right and 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 they benefit of that from a monetary perspective, but it's bringing nations together. It's bringing communities. Bringing looking after people both on and off reserve. It doesn't. You can go to any city, just you know, um, any any city, and you'll see our our people, you know, that are walking and roaming the streets trying to find a place to stay, you know, to survive another day, you know, and many are all First Nations are plagued. You know, by the so so, what do we do then? You know, do we continue sitting idle, sitting back, and saying, "Government, here, bail us out, bail us out, send us you, more money, yeah, send us more money, fix, yeah. you owe us." You yeah. know, and to me, it's like no. I I think that we need to take the bulls by the horn here, and start, you know, living a different life and start thinking different about you know our nation building, our nationhood, our sovereignty, and so on and so forth setting aside or saying look i don't want to be a victim anymore and 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 have you pay me because i feel bad and you feel sorry or you feel obliged and and i'm making a demand but to say let me be a partner partner let me work with you let's do something together that that's a hard thing because because our society is built around um, the grievance culture. We've got a lot of that going on right now. We're seeing it in, in stateside as well. Like this is a big step to say we want to move past that. It is. Not that there aren't it, real grievances and not that yeah. harm wasn't done, but we just, we need to move. Yeah, and, and exactly. You know, uh, that, that's the point is that you can never erase what was done, but nor can you allow yourself to continue sitting there and, and being stuck, you know, in that, in that dark, you know, that dark state, that dark past that was there. And, you know, but you need to have the means to learn from that as well. You need to have the means to educate your people to understand where you've come from, to appreciate where you're at and where you're going. And, you know, there are those that still need a lot of help, you know, from a mental side, mental health side to, you know, to get the strength to do that because there's been a lot of abuse, you know. Mm -hmm. And because people have endeared that abuse, people have become abusive themselves, you know, in a right. relationship. There's or always even cycles. With, or, yeah, there's, there's a cycle. So how do we break that cycle? So those that are able to, I think, have a responsibility, you know, a social responsibility or a moral responsibility 
to come back and to help nations and help individuals, you know, so they can quit, so we can move from the victim, you know, into something that's more positive. And that's mm-hmm. what this allows us to do. And that's what I talk about. It's not just transactional for us. You know, it's the responsibility that comes from the pipeline itself. It should be kind of an easy answer for governments to grasp instead of writing checks. And, and we're witnessing this a little bit in the COVID culture, which is we're just sending checks to everybody. Um, not sure that's solving a lot of problems. It's helping some people out in the short term. But the economic impact of that down the road is going to be huge. But is part of your case to government, look, you can't, you can't continue... Um, financially to afford us and uh, and our grievances if it's only just going to be a transactional arrangement like get more out of us too yeah well exactly that's you know when I look at the relationship you know it's uh, again we want we want a true partnership we want a true relationship we don't want to guilt people into doing right. things if you honestly believe in it, then do it. Yeah. If you don't, then don't tokenize it. Don't yeah. look at it as, you know, as, uh, well, the politics says that this is what I should do. My strategists say this and so on and so forth. So this is what we're going to do. Yeah. We don't need that. And project reconciliation and the style that I've always led from is that, you know, I believe this is what you guys want as well. You know, right. the, uh, uh, we Here, want this as well. Here's our common interest. Yeah, here's, right. here's our common interest. Right. But if you don't believe in it, don't just do it and splash a little bit of money at it yeah. and then move on to another project. Don't do it at all because you're doing more harm than good than to actually be... be Either a favor or yeah. opposed. Yeah, right? Exactly. But, yeah. yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> the government, there's all, we all know the controversy about pipelines across the country and, and the emphasis today on green economies and green environments. So the government to solve a problem buys the pipeline, okay? Everybody agrees they probably spent a little bit too much money buying it, but it kind of bought a little silence. What are you saying to them that you're gonna, fine, I'll pay the price even though you paid too much, uh, let's just do it and we want our stake in it and no questions asked. Well, again, from, you know, from our perspective, you know, from an Indigenous-led uh, perspective and Project Reconciliation, <laughs> we're always, I guess we're, to some degree, we've been conditioned to, you know, to always monitor the fact or, or look at the fact that we don't want people pointing the finger at us and saying, oh, look at the, you know, the uh, uh, First Nations people got another handout, mm-hmm. right? And and I believe that we're beyond that now. You know, I believe that t- this day and age, we're a lot smarter, you know, where we have more experience and we've been involved in business for a long period of time. So our position is that, no, we'll pay, even though you paid more, we'll pay you what you paid for it. Right. And no favors. No, no favors. Right. You know, um, you know, rather than, you know, we don't want to hand out. We want to hand up, you know, and 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 we'll we'll figure out the rest, you know. But you need to realize that if you don't have indigenous ownership within this or indigenous play within this opportunity, what's going to happen is going to be greater than not being involved. Well, this is uh, Canadians watched uh, Indigenous groups across the country shut down railways and access to cities. I mean, if, if you're not players, if you're not involved, if you're not vested, I'm assuming what you're saying is more of that can happen. Well, definitely. We, we got a taste of it, right? We got a taste of what, you know, the unfortunate situation, unfortunate or, or, or fortunate, depending on what side of the spectrum right. you're on, is that... Indigenous nations have been pushed to where they're pushed to, you know, and they live where they live, right across Canada, right? And it happens to be the main arteries of Canada. Some strategic points. Yes, yeah. and, and, you know, to, to no fault to, of theirs, yeah. right? You know, we were, you know, we signed treaty in Sounding Lake, Alberta, Provost, you know, where we have 80 to 90 of our people that are buried there. Then we were pushed over to Delmas, Saskatchewan. 1908, we were pushed out of Delmas, Saskatchewan, into Koshin, Saskatchewan, by Musaman. From Musaman, we got, we got, we went to where Thunderchild is up by Turtleford, right? You know, and that was no, that wasn't because we wanted to be moving around. <laughs> it's because we kept getting displaced, right? So now we're, you know, and and what happened to be there? There was a main railway station there, 
Right. You know, so again, you know, if indigenous peoples, if our people wanted to <laughs> shut it down, could have went to the tracks and, and, and shut it down. Right. My point being, though, is that if indigenous peoples aren't going to be engaged in a meaningful way, they are going to shake this nation the way they've demonstrated they've shaken it already. Right. And, and so, but the intent and according to our teachings, our worldview, our treaties and so on and so forth, was to mutually coexist and benefit right and so far it has been one-sided and that's the issue right for many rather than saying let's sit down let's figure this out let's find a way forward and let's put together a model a plan that's where project reconciliation has come now and said hey we have a model we have a plan it includes 340 nations you know, right across Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. We believe it's fair. Where's the beef? What's what's going on here? Right. And you've gone and raised capital, and you have uh, people who are around you, which are, this is a serious bid. This isn't just, oh, give us some ownership. This is money on the table. Well, this is, this is a serious offer that we yeah. put forward to government because, you know, the, the Prime Minister, uh, Justin, uh, has stated on national TV that 25, 50, 75, or even 100% equity ownership, ownership within the TMX pipeline. You know, the, he welcomes that, you know. So we've taken that, that challenge and said, hey, we can't afford this ride to go by without, you know, indigenous uh, participation. Right. And so we acknowledge, we thank Grand Chief Stuart Phillip within the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and 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 the protesters and blockaders for what they've done because if they didn't do that i honestly feel in project reconciliation fields that we wouldn't be talking about indigenous ownership within the tmx pipeline so it's it's forced everybody's hand yeah so what kind of response uh, are are you getting at this day i know these processes are so complicated and do you feel like there's a window that you're putting your offer on the table that somebody's reading it somebody's hearing it somebody's listening yeah well uh, you know let's let's back up right you, you had three nations three uh three first nations that have put together uh put an appeal forward you know on the tmx pipeline you know so they they appealed it you mm -hmm. know so so it was like wait and see you know many nations uh within british columbia there's 203 first nations that are there there's are those that are on the line and those that are off you know as well as uh, other parts of canada that, that have been you know waiting waiting and seeing what is the supreme court of canada going to do right well the decision came down that they're not going to hear it right and so whether you know we're jumping in the air saying right on or or not that's the reality you're that's, just in the next stage yeah, now. So, so now we're in the yep. next stage so now yep. you have the nations that are saying all right so now that that has happened, I think it's causing, you know, a second, you know, a, you know, for, for many nations are probably changing now right. in regards to their... So we're not going to be able to stop it. It's going to go yep. ahead yep. and forward in yep. some ways. So we want to participate. And furthermore, it's in your interest, meaning exactly. government and yep. business, to have us participate. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because if you don't, you know, uh, the unfortunate situation is going to be you're, you're going to have those that are going to join the protest. You're, you're, you know, you still have the tiny yeah. house warriors that are out there, yeah. you know, in Blue River that are saying, hey, you know, we're not leaving. You know, and as much as, you know, we, we applaud uh, Chief Kashmir of uh, to come Loops and Chief Loring, you know, of, um, of uh, Sim First Nation, you know, understand that they're taking. You still have the tiny house warriors within their territories mm -hmm. that are saying we ain't leaving. You know, so, right. but I think overall that it's, it's a positive, you know, that, um, that there is, there is more of an openness towards indigenous ownership of pipeline. And, and again, you make a point that you're not, you don't necessarily want to be a pipeline company. That's not your no. objective. This is a means to another set of ends. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, like it's it's an economic opportunity, mm -hmm. just like any of any any other company that has an opportunity to buy in. Right. Our fear is that, you know, we want to make sure that that what the government has said 
and has invited, you know, Israel. Mm-hmm. We don't want it, you know, just it was a sound bite. Yeah. And then nothing materializes, you know, and then when it's done being built, we get the token 10%. And you guys, is, you guys scrap over the scraps. Yeah. I mean, that's happened a lot. It's happened more than once. You we're scrapping over housing right now. You know, when CMEC, when every year when there's housing allocations in Saskatchewan, we're scrapping amongst each other. Mm-hmm. You know, who, who gets what? And if you happen to be a third-party community under third-party management, you don't qualify for CMEC housing, right? Education dollars. You know, where does the lion's share of those dollars go? You know, and so when you do the population, you do it in First Nations, so on and so forth. Saskatchewan is the one that always gets, you know, the um, short end of the stick. Short end of the stick, right? You know, so so here we are, you know, uh, trying to avoid those types of situations from happening. So one of the things that that the general public sees in the communities, and we've talked about this, but I want to drill down a bit, is different bands, different nations, different. Uh, native communities having very different views on pipeline issues yes we want you to come through no you can't come through or we're going to kill all the dolphins and in the sea right when you talk about 340 nations what does that represent well that here again you're you're it, it represents you know right from british columbia all the way to, to saskatchewan and so when you're talking about British Columbia, you're hearing about, you know, what about our salmon? What about mm-hmm. our marine life? What about, you know, our, our land, our, our water, and so on and so forth? And, but that's consistent because that's embedded within our Indigenous worldview. So it's a given, you know, from, from my perspective anyways, and this is where I talk about it's not, for us, it's not transactional, it's a responsibility, right? right? So it being a responsibility, first and foremost, we pay homage you know, to, to the animal life, to the marine life, and to all lives, you know, the, our relationship to Mother Earth, you know, our relationship to the sun, uh, and, you know, what have you. That, that's who we are. That's Our ceremonies happen year-round for that, right? So so we hear this loud and clear. So, so the challenge to Project Reconciliation is that, well, what are you going to do about it? You hear what we're saying. What are you doing about it? Well, we've gone out and we went to research and we've, um, you know, created, um, well, this marine emergency response, Mm -hmm. you know, um, so we, we've created, um, you know, policy around that, how we're going to deal with that and so on and so forth. And then the others are, uh, is partnering up with a major, you know, shipping company, you know, that is going to be transporting, you know, the, the oil, you know, and, and how that the changes that they've made you know within a shipping industry you to know, respect to, those other things yeah that to are, respect right. the marine life and, and so on and so forth so again demonstrating that we not only heard you but we reacted to it mm-hmm. you know we we've acted on it and we're getting some guarantees and we're getting some guarantees <laughs> and here's where we're at so project reconciliation again is more than it's not just a, a one-off company it's it's involved in areas that make sense that make a difference you know to move from this to something else that is better i think that's part of the problem with the whole discussion about energy and oil and gas i mean which is going to be around and which is going to be needed for a very long time we are not going to be running our economy in places where it's minus 50 in the winter on solar energy tomorrow right yeah that may come down the road but that you can talk about an uh, a a pipeline today and still be respectful of the green needs and the the environment in which it must exist well and this is where i talk about it's 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 a means to an end Mm -hmm. right obviously you know our thinking is that yeah we're we're gonna we're gonna leverage we're gonna springboard off oil and gas into green energy clean technology and so on and so forth like that that's the natural possession that we're going to be going and that's exactly what norway did mm-hmm. you know to, to change right. what they're doing and to to be involved in it but right now we can't even have those discussions in our own first nations communities because we're so busy busy battling poverty yeah so where does green energy come from where does clean technology how can we even found have those types of discussions you know when one we're underfunded 
right? Second is that we're so busy trying to live, you know, the last thing that we're able to do is teach our kids the language because we're so busy trying to feed them. But And, and that's the global issue, right? When yes. we and all of our, uh, you know, uh, privilege or because of we of where we live we can sort of say oh well we need green economies and you can't have that dirty oil and gas to developing nations that aren't even at that stage and we want to preempt them from even having some of the uh the basics of life because we want to go turn everything green i mean that's it's the same issue to get people out of poverty they need some work well exactly <laughs> and 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 you know and and to teach our kids like if they have mm -hmm. if all they've experienced and, and witnessed through their eyes is multi-generation of social development, of welfare, yeah. and no education. Well, what's the chance of that child being successful right. and being a, a, a positive contributor to the Canadian economy? Yeah. Okay. But yet, you come back and you go, you know, high unemployment, high dropout, and so on and so forth, but yet, we're trying to be a solution, right? right? But the system, or the attitudes is is creating that void, you know, to allow that to flourish to even happen. Is there a, something going, I mean, whether it's just individual differences or whether it's a generational thing, whether it's tied to levels of education, I mean, you're out there with a, you know, a master's degree, all of this. Do you, uh, does that mean you see the world differently in terms of those solutions that you're in search of? Well, I, well, I think it's, it comes from the upbringing, right? You know, like, um, you know, I, I'm going to be 52 years old. I've never drank in my life. I've never smoked, so on and so forth. And, and I don't know how that happened because I, drew, I grew up in alcohol, yeah. you know. And, uh, for, but for whatever reason, that, it, it came out the way it did. So my children, right? You know, my oldest is 30, never drank, never smoked, so on and so forth. You know, was 17 when she graduated, 21 when she got her teaching degree, you know. Uh, and so my point being is that that positive reinforcement, you know, that positive Has to be example. what they see. Yeah, you know, uh, between the mom and dad, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and to have that, you know, that, that family, the, the mother, the father, the children, so on and so forth. If, if they see that they have that. This is how they're going, and that reinforcement, this is what they're going to be living through. You know, uh, this is, the, the result should be this at the end of the day. Unfortunately, though, we have a lot of single parents, mm -hmm. you know, and we have a lot of, you know, young men, young women, you know, that lack one or the other, you know, lack either the mother or the father, right? And, and so, so no role models. Yeah, so no... the role models and so on and so forth. And then the education system has doesn't have the means to support that and you know we have more kids in care today in, in child welfare you know than the height of residential yeah. school yeah you know so how do we change that you know to where it becomes prevention you know um, rather than reaction you know rather than you know taking the you know old residential school yeah taking take the, the kids, kids and, and 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 take them else so there's so much you know that has to change and it's changing but I think that it's, you, you you know, it's not a generational thing. For me, you know, it's um, it's that positive. It's, it's We have a lot of our elders that are progressive thinkers. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of this encouragement and so on and so forth. The unfortunate thing is that when you come to the reserve, many of our reserves, you know, you get caught up in the social ills that are there. Not yeah. all reserves are like that. Many and, and many reserves are doing good things. It's just not enough, you yeah. know, and, and that not enough is because there's not enough resources to reinforce, you know, the, uh, there's not enough money to reinforce the or programs. If there's been corrupt leadership yeah. as there yeah. is in, yeah. in other places. So the, so, so project reconciliation. So you, you become, uh, and we're, we're not done with this part of the discussion, but you become majority owners of this. You're going to generate, um, wealth. Uh, where you can not just hand it out to people, but create jobs, perhaps buy or invest in other industries or other projects across the country, which again gives Indigenous kids options. It gives them an example. It helps create work ethic. It's hard to have a work ethic if you live on handouts of 
some kind or another of which we've been doing for God knows how many years now, right? You've got to change the mindset. Yeah. Well, I, I, and that, that's usually important, right? Is that, you know, so when we look at project reconciliation and, you know, there's, and the, the money that it's going to generate, you know, the dollars the, that it's going to generate, you know, anyway, you know, approximately 230 million plus, and you look at okay, so what do we do with this? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the intent behind this? You know, we we know from experience that this is what we've seen, and that doesn't seem to work. And we know that if we did this, that would work. So, for example, you're, you're caught between how much should we be distributing to uh, to 340 communities, right? Uh, it you know on a per capita basis. So per cap, here's what it is. In Saskatchewan, we have the gaming framework agreement. From there's the First Nations Trust. Here's how much is distributed to 75 communities. So all that money goes up. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, minus the money that goes to the corporate office for them right, to do right. their business. And then you have, well, how much should, a, should go to a sovereign wealth fund? Right? So the sovereign wealth fund, so this is the percentage. Should 20... 40, 50% go into the per cap, and then the rest goes over here to the sovereign wealth, right? Because future considerations, future considerations are children's to children. Cash in your pocket today. Yes. You know, so, and providing that, you know, that, that, that support to get involved in other future infrastructure opportunities, P3 projects, mm -hmm. you know, energy, um, power lines, and, you know, and so on and so forth. Because a lot of these, opportunities nine times out of ten are going to exist exist on your main reserve or in your traditional territories and gone are the days gone should be the days where we look at it and we go man we'd love to invest but we don't have the means so we accept what we're given you know, we do our best to to negotiate but you're you're negotiating from a from a position of Weakness. Of weakness, right? Whereas if you are standing there, you know, being supported, you know, if Thunderchild is there being supported by a multi-billion dollar, you know, sovereign wealth fund, the person you're negotiating with is going to have a different attitude from the way they're dealing with right. you. And you're going to be there to position to either buy them out or buy a majority stake or be a 50-50 owner. No longer do you have to accept, you know, what you're being told. So the sovereign wealth fund is what creates this tremendous opportunity to position First Nations to realize what they've dreamt of realizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's for us, that's where our focus has been. And I believe that when industry looks at how do we get a bang for our buck, you know, in partnering up with Indigenous peoples and First Nations people, government as well has believed in aggregation. They believed on how, if we do this, how can we get the, you know, the, the best, you know, the, um, the best outcome for mm -hmm. many nations if we agree to do this with so-and-so, you know, and Project Reconciliation, I believe, had checked off all the boxes, you know, uh, and says that this is how you can, because this is exactly what everybody's talking about, and but we need them to believe in what they've been talking about as well. Well, that's the thing. It'll bring us back to that question because it's not like this is, I mean, I mean this is a very sophisticated project you're putting forward, sophisticated proposal. But Indigenous people have been trying to do this for a while, which is let us be partners, not recipients, you know, cutting up the spoils, the cash after the deal's been done, right? I don't understand why governments... Uh, don't understand, and this is past and present and maybe future, don't understand that this is a better way. We have this discussion on some level in Canada about um, guaranteed annual income. You know, if you could just put people on a guaranteed annual income with no disincentive to work, here's your basic income for a month, 1100 bucks, 1200 bucks. Go out and work, make as much money as you want. If you become a millionaire, we'll tax it back, right? But we'll get rid of all these complicated bureaucracies and welfare programs, most of which have disincentives to work built into them. You're kind of saying the same thing, which is let's find some project here which is going to give everybody 
an income from which they can go or funds from that they can use to educate to work their way out of poverty what like what don't governments get about this well the clear point you know uh, look at Fort Mackay you know Fort Mackay the uh, Suncor reached out and said hey let's partner you know and and you know so the average income for Fort Mackay is seventy thousand dollars plus Right. So you can imagine, mm -hmm. you know, what that has done for the community, you know, in empowering them for them to realize something that is different, you know, and, 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 and kudos to, you know, Fort Mackay First Nation and Miksu, you know, for able to, to uh, for being able to realize that kind of relationship. And, you know, kudos to uh, Suncor, you know, for saying, let's do this, you yeah. know, and being that example, you know, so it's it's no longer you know, um, a boogeyman or is no longer to, you know, where we should be uh, hesitant to deal with indigenous peoples, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on a macro scale, you know, to, to realize these opportunities. Um, the benefit, you know, is far greater uh, of doing something that mm -hmm. positive than it is doing nothing at all and, and complaining about it. You know, so here we are, you know, with this... Um, you know, where government and industry should be stepping up and saying, you know what, we're going to take a closer look in regards to what, what is being proposed here, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we cannot afford to not get involved. And, and so this is what Project Reconciliation is providing that solution. We're not saying here, give it to us. You know, we're saying, let us buy it. Yeah. You know, let us, let us demonstrate, you know, what this is going to mean, you know, to all of us, not just some and make, of us. make the concept of reconciliation something real. Yes. As opposed to just words. Yeah. And it gets concerning that two years ago, you know, reconciliation was at the top. That's all mm -hmm. you heard. Because I was, I was chief, you know, when I was, when I was hearing this. Right. And it excited me that, you know, that, you know, that finally, you know, here, here we are, you know, and, and uh, you know, we, we had... Prime Minister Harper that did the announce the the, the apology, mm -hmm. you know, and right on we have the residential school apology, and then now you have you know the next Prime Minister that came in that said reconciliation and this is what it means and so on and so forth, you know I I was I was so pumped, you know, <laughs> and excited about that that when my term came up as chief I thought there's something more that I should be doing than what I'm doing as chief. Not that the chief's position is not you know, the highest position that one, you know, one is honored with, but to take on a different role to, to go to a bigger nations, stage, yeah. to do a big, go yeah. to a bigger stage, to bring in nations and yeah. to challenge uh, or to, you know, or to put our, our hand out, you know, to, or, or to extend our hand, you know, to government saying we're in. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden, two years later, you don't hear much about reconciliation anymore. I'm wondering if you think there's a window at this point. We're still obviously living through the COVID crisis, but when the government announces that it has $343 billion in deficit and $1.2 trillion debt, there's, there are not enough taxpayers in Canada for them to tax us to pay that back, right? Because that's the only source of revenue. So you're proposing a solution not only that's about you and your people in this context it's about solving a problem for government because they're up to their necks in debt well when you look at you know we the, are in, up yeah. to our necks in well, when debt. you look at the deficit that's being talked about you know the untapped market is the indigenous peoples right right so if we can create an opportunity if we can create the means you know, to our people to put them to work, you know, to bring their average income more than what welfare is. Right. You have, and, and not that we're not taxpayers already, but... But become... But become... Taxpayers uh, based on yeah, based, serious income. Based on serious income that is going to change the quality of life of our people so they can, you know, they can live longer. <laughs> they can live yeah. healthier. And, and their children can involve, uh, can enjoy, you know, the organized sports that are out there and so on and so forth. If our, you know, we have to, government has no choice but to open that opportunity up because you, you ain't going to get 
another oil and gas company or another company, you know, I would hard pressed to, uh, I'd be hard pressed to believe that another company is going to pay government, the Canadian government, what they paid, you know, uh, to buy yeah. TMX. That some private. We're, we're here yeah. saying, yeah. hey, we know you paid too much, but we'll we'll but step we'll up. pay we'll yeah. we'll pay you what you paid for it. Yeah. Right. I don't know if any other company would be doing that. Yeah. But we're serious. When you you talked about reconciliation being sort of the the thing a couple of years ago and everybody was talking about it and you were hopeful, we all turn on our televisions at night now and see what's going on stateside and here too. Um, And the signs are Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. That's the focus of the conversation. You see a few uh, in the stories that they do here. You'll see a few signs here and there that say Indigenous Lives Matter, but it's not prominent it's not big um how how do you react when you see that well i think that you know social justice needs to happen all over you know uh, but you know i shouldn't say but social justice needs to happen period right, right? there's this there's, there's there's systemic racism you know it, and indigenous peoples have uh, have been a brunt of that you know in canada you know that's it's um you know, I, I can appreciate that Black Lives Matter, and I agree with that. When you go back and you look at our history, you know, we continue to be marginalized. We continue to be treated. Look at the jails. You know, it's something my brother-in-law, Curtis Hyde, and I, have, uh, you know, has been sharing with me and, and has, you know, brought this to my attention, you know, and really pointed it out last night, you know, when we were talking. You know, the, how come, you know, like, shouldn't it be more Indigenous Lives Matter? You know, uh, like in in Canada, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't have just you know, the numbers. The, the 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 black people. You don't have them filling up the jails. Yeah. You know, the majority of the jails are being filled up by indigenous peoples. I worked in the Prince Albert Penitentiary. This had to be thirty, forty years ago. I mean, it was filled then. Yeah. And it has, and 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 none of that has changed. You know, so and so it it seems like it's an afterthought. You know, the Black Lives Matter. And Indigenous Lives Matter, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and again, you know, we should not be an afterthought in society, in today's right. society. You, it should be front and center. What are we going to do about it? And so on and so forth. But it comes to a point where you're just like, well, you know, like it's everybody takes a cause when it's another nationality as opposed to, mm-hmm. you know, the Indigenous. And, and it's like, here they go again. Here the Indigenous people go again, you know, playing the race card, playing the victim and so on and so forth. Well, you have no choice but to bring the issue to light when you have murdering in this is murdered in this this woman right men high incarceration rate your kids are being taken into care right high dropout rate drugs high unemployment problem. drugs and so on and so forth Thanks, yeah. and then you have people that are pointing back at indigenous people and saying god you guys you guys are a burden to society hey <laughs> the system needs to quit burdening us <laughs> <laughs> right and and so project reconciliation is stepping up and saying no more yeah we, we don't want to be part we don't of want that. that either right this is what we want so to whoever is listening <laughs> right help us help us help you yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> really i mean i do think that's that's what you're saying which is we're we're, we're trying to get off the books here boys and girls give us the you know take us seriously it's not re, read the project, say, okay, you want to be partners, let's, let's change the game. Well, look at the Indian Act, right? You go back to the Indian Act, Thunder Child has, you know, million dollars in their trust account, mm-hmm. you know, their capital trust account. They want to do this on their reserve, they want to build this, they want to create this, and so on and so forth. What do we have to do because of the Indian Act? We have to fill out a, a do a proposal. <laughs> a band council resolution, get, send it to the Minister of Indian Affairs, and they determine if, if, if what we're asking for is legit, but it's our money. This is not government money. This is money we've created from our own economic development dollars, not using government funds. But yet we have to ask, and we have to get the okay, you know, from the good old Indian agent, in allowing us to do something that we shouldn't otherwise have to you know, ask anybody. This day and age, we have to get a yes or a no, you know, from government. From the equivalent of the Indian yeah. agent, yeah. 
What 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 really needs to happen there? I mean, you're talking about let's just put the project aside, and you're you want to deal with government on that. What are what are two or three other just it's got to happen now changes? Well, the Indian Act needs to go mm -hmm. first off. Um, yeah. The other is that, you know, uh, we need to sit down and come up with an equitable, equ equitable model, you know, uh, between regions, you know, on, on funding. You know, when you look at the disparity, what, what do you mean? well, in, in education, okay. in health, yeah. you know, why does, you know, um, there, there uh, you know, there are regions that get more than what other regions should be getting based on population based on reserve size and, and so on and so forth, you know, the, um, there's disparities, you mm -hmm. know, why is that, you know, how, you know, uh, so, so the fairness in that, um, you know, the, but what do you do? You, do you do it based on need? How do you determine that? That's yeah, well, I, I think that's, that's where we would create this common table, you know, to sit down to see how, you know, this can be uh, distributed, right? Like, mm -hmm. for example, project reconciliation, we're sitting, you know, amongst ourselves and listening to, you know, to the nations themselves to say, you know what, there's, we only have 13 people within our band or we have 30 people within our band, right. you know, uh, so we know from a population perspective, we're going to get hammered, Right. you know, so when you're talking about percentage, you know, what percentage our nation would get if it's population driven, we're going to get hammered. So I think there are other things that need to be considered, you know, in this formula, you know, right. well, yeah, you, you got, you got if you have 30 or 13 band members versus Lac La Ronde's Cree Nation that says 11,000, you know, or, you know, other nations, you know, uh, Siksika or, you know, the Blood Tribe that have more than that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you're going to get, so, so again, there's, there's different things that have to be weighted in, you know, to create, you know, the, as much, you're never going to get it right, but you're going to make it as fair as it can be, you know. I'm, I'm going to ask another question, then Paul might just jump off the bridge here. <laughs> I'm going to keep on going here. I want to ask a, a, a different kind of question, a broader question, which is, and, and this perplexes a lot of people, I think, on, uh, on all sides. Uh, how do we make this work? If, if we've got nation-to-nation -nation government, if we've got, how many First Nations are there in Canada? 633. 633. Okay, so that's nation. Then you've got the Canadian nation. Then you've got 10 provinces. Then you've got three territories. All of it. How, I mean, a lot of people say even at this point, Canada is almost ungovernable just because of the population differences, the... Um, the economic bases that are so different. How do you actually make that work? What does nation to nation negotiation mean? How does self government? I mean, I know these are big, big questions, but just give me a little insight on how you see that working. Does does Canada continue to exist? Do provinces continue to exist? Do we live in parallel universes together? Like, what does that mean? Well really we shouldn't be responding to Canada we should be responding to the Governor General and Red of the Queen right? <laughs> yes <laughs> I knew you were going to go there which is why I'm asking you this question <laughs> <laughs> and, and that then that has always been you know our uh, our stand and will continue to be because you know um, you know it's uh, you have Canada that's a nation state right you know so so when you when, when you look at the history and the relationship the relationship is with the Queen not with Canada but how's that? I mean, Canada exists, and yeah, we Canada, have a government, yeah. and we have all these provinces, and we have those rules. Are you saying that that can't exist, or we have to find some way to? No, I, I think it coexist. It, it, it could possibly coexist, but you have the governor general. You know, our our the person that we should be communicating with, and that should we should be getting our support from. You know, is is from the Queen's representative, from the governor general. But she can't and, sign off on project recon reconciliation that goes to the finance department and to cabinet well we wouldn't be talking about signing off anything you know if, <laughs> I, I, again you know it, it, and it's not a philosophical position because this is you know this is where differences have have come right yeah. is understanding the history understanding you know the crown you know um and in, in, in canada over here so you have NRTA, you know, Natural Resource Transfer Agreement of 1930, which was, you know, the belief of First Nations, 
is that you know the the resources natural resources were just taken to give and without any consent mm -hmm. right so would we be talking about having this discussion if that wasn't the case or would we be having this discussion if the intent of treaty was you know was it was honored and respected which is mutually benefiting and coexisting right you know so so now when you talk about resource revenue sharing <laughs> right you, you you know at least get something out of it right you know um, at least get a benefit of it you're not getting that benefit you know because the province is coming in saying we have no jurisdiction on reserve mm -hmm. but meanwhile they have the resources Right, and so First Nations, the only way they're going to get, they're going to realize their benefit of the resource is to buy their way into the boardrooms. Right, mm -hmm. but I think that all in all, I think, I believe, and I've always what do you call supported, and being a cheerleader of it, is that different jurisdictions can work together. You know, there could be code shared jurisdictions, co jurisdictions, and so on and so forth, and we see it. You know, it's happening now in education, it's happening now in child welfare, mm -hmm. uh, it's happening now in health. So it's, the problem though is that, is that entities and government and others need to quit using indigenous peoples when it, when it creates an advantage for them and to start being true partners and honest partners. You know, for example, Turtleford Hospital, you know, was supposed to be built it was supposed to be a partnership between Turtle River and Thunder Child First Nation, mm -hmm. and the hospital was supposed to be built on reserve. Once they got Thunder Child support number wise, and they were able to get the funding, right, and all that was done, went back to town. Went back to town, right? And 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 so you have, you know, these uh, and school divisions do it all the time, right? And, and and again, you know, numbers are being used. You know, but the true benefit where we should be all benefiting, you know, so now you have small towns of Saskatchewan, some of them are, a lot of them are closing, yeah. right? Because First Nations are saying, no, we don't need to deal with you. You know, we're, we're smarter. We're bigger than that now, right? CIBC closed in Turtleford because our people go to either North Battleford, Lloyd Minster, Meadow Lake, because there's First Nations Bank of Canada and Meadow Lake, or they'll go to Saskatoon. CIBC no longer exists, right? They have a credit union mm -hmm. because of the farmer's money, but a lot of our people don't go to credit union. You know, so, so, but is that the answer? Absolutely not, right? But yeah. when we go to small town Saskatchewan, do you see your people working there? No, right? But how much money goes into small town Saskatchewan when you live right. beside a First Nation? Lumber yards, thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars goes in there you know, for housing and so on. So to build on reserve. Yeah. So the answer, so I always say Thunder Child was not built by only Thunder Child band members. There were local farmers that came there and assisted Thunder Child in building Thunder Child, right? And so part of our history, you know, pr from a project reconciliation perspective is acknowledging, you know, those grandfathers, those parents of, of these young people today that are alive and acknowledging, you know, that contribution that they made to our community. And many of our people work for these farmers as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have it, but from a grander scale, we're not getting it. That's the thing though, isn't it? It, it sometimes works very well on yeah. a, on a local level, whatever the connections are. I'm a member of Legion. My dad was a member of Legion. There were, you know, uh, indigenous native soldiers, indigenous soldiers, they had a relationship that superseded color or where anybody lived because they had that shared history. Yeah. Got to build a little bit more of that. You have to, you know, and, and we, um, and whether we want to realize it or not, you know, uh, we're going to be running into each other. It doesn't matter where we go, right? Yeah. Um, we're the or what we growing... call whatever land yeah. it is that we're running into yeah. each other on. <laughs> we're the fastest growing population yeah. out there. No, no. And sure either not. we do something with this runaway train, yeah, you know, or it's going to collide someplace and probably won't be good. Do you guys think that you, through this project, can really help or really tackle those issues? Uh, I mean, I live next door to a First Nation, and you know there are alcohol issues there are drug issues there are gang issues. like these are serious you see it on urban streets yep. city streets as well can you do it I, I believe we can um and i've seen 
you know, there's a lot of good models out there. There's a lot of nations, uh, groups that are putting together real good uh, uh, programs that are out there. And, but they lack the resources, you know, for whatever reason. It, it almost seems like, like there is this, um, uh, let's help the First Nations, but let's don't help them too much where they, where they get ahead of us. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and we need to get out of that mentality. Yeah. You know, we need we need to get into like you were saying earlier, Senator, which was, you know, if you're, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, so on and so forth. You're an American. You're an American. Yeah. You know, so if you're Canadian, you're Canadian, right? Yeah. Uh, and and how do we get along? How do we, you know, uh, benefit each other? So project reconciliation, you know, in the wealth, sovereign wealth that they would create that they're going to create is going to change you know it, it's going to create that change what happens into the community because again you know you have in order for first nations to realize you know this opportunity they too you know s- there are probably nations out there that need to fix up their governance with their within their own communities exactly and and so this is where project reconciliation as well can partner up with those entities like the First Nations uh, Finance Authority, you know, First Nations Management Branch, uh, you know, the F&B out of Vancouver, you know, could potentially partner up to help the governance and help, you know, shape up the finance department, you know, within their policies and not dictate it, right. but to help them realize that in order to realize this and to get you your mind progressive, your you got to clean up, yep. right? Yep. And, and, you know, so... And there are probably just a handful of those nations that are like that, where their leadership is solid in every community, but their governance, they, they may not have the means to, to fix their governance up within their community. And so project reconciliation, you know, is, is more than, than just, you know, creating this opportunity. Okay, we're going to leave it there for today, but you have a kind of a standing invitation. I think we're just going to keep this yeah. conversation going because it's it's really important that we're all talking. No, thank you very much, uh, Senator. Yeah. And, um, you know, a, a lot of um, my understanding comes from uh, my experience, uh, what I've seen through a chief, uh, being chief and uh, through university. But I, I get a lot of different perspectives and, and um you know, from my brother-in-law here, Curtis Hyde, who has... Um, <laughs> he's sitting cha- here with us yeah, in the room, so yeah, and, that's and, why and, we're talking about him. Yeah, and, and he's <laughs> he's challenged me to think differently as well. Well, what about this? What about mm-hmm. that? And I, I really respect that and, and welcome that. And I don't mind talking behind his back in front of his face. So. <laughs> that's what we've been doing. Yeah. Well, I'm going to thank you both then uh, for being here, and, and we'll talk again soon. Project Reconciliation and an Indigenous-led organization that wants to buy a majority interest in TMX. Uh, it's going to be an interesting decision that yeah. that comes down at some point, or at least I hope there's a decision uh, at some point on this. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us for this edition of No Nonsense, a conversation with Delbert Wapass. He is the executive chair and founder of Project Reconciliation. Of course, a former chief, a three-term chief of Thunderchild First Nation in Saskatchewan. We'll be having more of these conversations. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pamela Wallen.